Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back. We're just gonna get into some Domri gameplay. We've managed to climb to in the number 20, which has been great. And the other cool update is that uh, I joined Team MTG SS, which was really cool. Um, these folks have been like putting up content for a long time and uh, really just trying to get deck lists out there and a lot of them just really are passionate about the game and have been, you know, climbing to those higher levels. Um, and I, I just find that, especially in the dis the team Discord, like there's so much going on, that's been great. But even when I was not a part of the team and I would just reach out to some of these folks in the MTG Spellslingers Discord that I had played against or seen on the ladder, and I think that everyone's been, you know, super friendly and very much willing to you know, discuss, like, how to play the game, and, and just a lot of folks who, who really enjoy trying to think about the game, you know, at the sort of at the highest level, um, so I'm really happy to be working with them now, um, and I just wanted to really just put up a, a gameplay video, I know I've taken some breaks in the last couple of weeks, um, just really talking about what it's like to, you know, really try and climb and just get as high rank as possible, if that's your goal. For me, my goal was just to hit top 20 towards the end of the month, so I'm just happy that I was able to do that for myself. Um, but whatever your goal is, I think that I really want to recommend Domri as a really, really strong deck against most of the field. And we'll talk about the bad matchups and kind of how that works. <laughs> um, but I definitely want to start with just getting into how it all works. Um, so let's just get into it now. Well, this is what we're running. And, uh, you know, there are definitely variations. I think there are budget-friendly versions as well to climb from, you know, lower, uh, lower rank to higher rank. I think you can play around with uh, cheap, aggressive cards if you don't have... You know, some of these uh, higher-end cards like Lava Wave, Crater Hoof, um, General, Ulrich. Um, you know, that it can be tough to build a deck when you, you don't have the materials. But if you've got the materials, I think this is the way you want to build it. And I just want to shout out, actually, real quick, um, uh, a uh, team member, uh, Beyond Bounds, who's just been doing a tremendous amount of work around Domre, and I can't recommend you know, this article enough because it's really just got some of the the most important essentials and the most specific sort of in-depth information about how to play Domri in the field. Um, so Beyond Bounds, if you've seen them on the ladder, you know that they're big Domri enthusiasts. So uh, I really take after them. I was playing Rel probably from about 100 to around 50 on the ladder. And then I just had, you know, I, ha I felt like I was having more difficult matchups with Rao, and I was like, you know, I haven't picked up Domri in a little while, let me see how that goes, and I just felt like I have won so many more games playing Domri than Rao, and I don't know if that's just luck, I don't know if that's just with how the matchups are breaking down, but it just feels like every step of the way when you're playing Domri, as long as you don't have a really unlucky, like, mulligan, where it's like, you've got like a, a four drop, a five drop, and an eight drop in your hand, we're like, okay, you're going to lose that game if that happens. But for the most part, it just feels like at every point in the game, you are getting closer to inevitability with Lava Wave, Overrun, or Crater Hoof, and your opponent is just trying to somehow interrupt you doing that, which really, it's pretty hard to do that, unless you're playing decks like Teferi or Liliana, and I'll get into those matchups in a little bit. It just feels like every step of the way you are pressuring your opponent and you're working towards an endgame. Um, and I, I just really love the, the way it plays. So I think the first thing we got to talk about is the land, right? So Gaia's Cradle, I had not played with this land much uh, before this deck. And I, I think it's, it's a little, it's interesting how it works, right? So instead of having a percent chance that this land works, what it says is starting on turn seven, right? So you really want to track, I would say, turn five and six. You want to take a look at your board state and say, okay, how many creatures do I have? How likely is it that they're going to live? Because what I don't want to do is make some trades on turn five or six that are going to make it so when turn seven happens, 
I have only one creature on the board. Um, the magic number is eight. Eight mana. Why? Because of Lava Wave, because of Overrun, and because of Crater Hoof Behemoth. You want to be hitting that number eight. And sometimes with Birds of Paradise and Gatstaff Agitators, you're hitting eight mana by turn five. And that's, that's where the deck really feels unfair. But the main point about this is you just really want to be mindful as you're getting closer to turn seven of how many creatures you have in play. But it's it's an incredibly powerful land in this build because it will guarantee you, essentially, as much mana as you need on turn seven, right? As long as you're playing around, you know, blocking an attack properly and trying to protect your creatures when you need to, you're just guaranteeing that you're going to get a huge mana burst. And sometimes when you're really running away with the game, it's just guys create a feels like a win more and you can just keep playing creatures and trading them and playing more creatures. Um, but I think this is the land for this mid range kind of big Dom race strategy. And if you haven't tried it, it definitely takes a little getting used to. The main thing is just know that on turn seven, it's going to happen and all the turns subsequently after. So you just really need to be mindful of your creature count, probably starting around turn five or six. Six at the latest, right? Because of the following turn, it's going to go off. So that's Guy's Cradle. Um, I think we'll go over just some individual cards real quick for people who aren't familiar. Sundancer, it's a one mana, two one. So you're like, okay, that's whatever. But when you have those two available mana, it flips into a four three. So often a play pattern that's pretty great is you go Sundancer turn one, Turn two, attack for two, play nothing, turns into a 4-3. Turn three, you know, play Agitator's Flock, Worm's Wake, or maybe you want a Grudge Match, play a two drop. Um, it, it just, what this means is it's not a dead draw after turn one, and often, you know, making a 4-3 body for kind of free in this deck um, is just a solid creature. And you're getting your creature count up for your Domri passive, which is the other important thing, is you're just going to be making a lot of free 1-mana 3-2s with how this deck plays out. Channel of Might, probably the best turn 1 play. You know, you're just often going to play a 1-mana 3-3, pressures your opponent, whether they're aggro or control. Um, it's just going to come down early and do a good amount of damage. And even when you get it later, a 1-mana 3-3 is just an efficient rate. Um, Birds of Paradise... I remember when I first saw Birds of Paradise in Domriless, and I was like, what is going on? Because um, it's just not like an aggro creature. It's not getting you extra bodies. But what it does really well is, A, it counts as a body towards uh, Gaia's Cradle, right? Because it counts the number of creatures you have on the board. And B, it can also just be a chump blocker when you need it. And then the most important part is that it makes a fragile mana gem. So... Uh, you know, often you'll get to go like Sundancer, Turn 2, Birds of Paradise, Fragile Mana Gem counts towards Moonlight, so it flips. And you're just, you're, you're accumulating this mana over time to really just pump out some of these high-end spells. Um, Treetop Lookout, so this is, <clears throat> we'll stop here for a second and talk about the, the Teferi matchup. And again, definitely recommend going on mtg.ss.com to look up that specific matchup um, when you're thinking about playing Domri uh, into Teferi. So Treetop Lookout, obviously really good answer for playing into Teferi. The reason why is often it's not hard to get somewhere in the ballpark of 10 mana. And so what you can do is you can play Treetop Lookout first, disarm all their traps, and then you land your Crater Huff, your Overrun, or your Lava Wave. So this is specifically in here for the Teferi matchup because that matchup is very, very challenging. It's not unwinnable, but having played it a few times, it's it's pretty apparent how difficult it is. Um, and I'm running one treetop. It might be best to run two. I think Beyond Bounds likes running two. Um, I just haven't seen a ton of Teferi on the ladder. So for me, I'm just kind of trying to tune my deck to what I'm seeing. Um, I still think it's probably wise to have at least one in some of those matchups. Kind of similar thing with Tarmogoyf. You don't want this in your opening hand, but it's just always a really efficient creature, especially when you're running. We've got one artifact in the deck with Gruel Club, and we've got traps in terms of Wormway, creatures, spells. So it's it's going to be pretty big. 
Um, Colonian Tusker, no brainer, just a really efficient green creature. Infuser, I really like because you're fighting with creatures, you're using fight spells, and also often you're like attacking into them. They deal damage to your creature, but it survives, and then you can make sure that it, it survives for potentially a, a second attack with Elvish Infuser. Um, I think it is a card that is better against most of the field, but of course, like you'd rather have a treetop lookout over an Elvish Infuser in those matchups. Grudge Match, just the best way to be interacting with the board early. Um, and then I'll definitely talk about this card for a second. So Gatstaff Agitators can really just make... This is what allows you to get to 8 mana on turn 5. Because you can play this on turn 3. It's going to get you a mana. Turn 4, you're going to flip it. You're going to get another Fragile Gem. And it's a it's a really unimpressive body, right? 3-1 for 3 or 5-1 for 3. Um, which is also why I like Infuser. Because making a 5-1 into a 5-3 means it can attack past those smaller creatures. It's a small, small sort of interaction, but Agitators just allows you to accelerate a crazy amount in terms of mana, and it's really, you, I would say, like, I played a mirror match the other day, and my opponent, you know, blocked with their Agitators before it had flipped, and they had, they definitely had the option to not do that. It feels, I would say it feels pretty bad when you only get one Fragile Mana Gem off the card. And when you get two, it just feels so worth it. You've invested three mana, really, to get two mana back um, that you can use later. And and it definitely has a really advantageous effect for what we're trying to do. Hermit of the Flock, I think I said this in a prior video, this is why aggro is going to have a really hard time. Aggro can be Domri if you stumble, but this card just making a 4-4 four -four that nets, you know gains you two life and it's a 1-1 one -one body... And, because you're playing Domri, it counts both the Hermit and the Sheep as playing two creatures. So your creature count goes up, right? You go one drop, two drop, three drop. Then on turn four, no matter what creature you play, you're getting a War Boar from your passive. So he's just such, a, such an efficient creature. Worm's Wake, just the best trap for this deck that you can be playing. Because if you have the open mana with the traps and you have a Moonlight creature, they're going to flip. And Worm's Wake is just extremely efficient for playing around certain traps, baiting out traps potentially, all, as well as playing around Day of Judgment. So, just to, or honestly, what I'll find is I look at the board state, I have a lot of creatures, I go for an attack, they're trying not to block as much, and then I know they have to answer some creature next turn, or they're dead. I'll just prep Worm's Wake, knowing that a creature is probably going to die on my five or four creature board. And then I'll have another threat for the next turn. Now, Gruel Club, I really... It's funny because like, I think a lot of Domri's signature cards are not really great for what we're doing. It's probably a little bit more tuned towards the aggro strategy. But this is just a really efficient card. It's just three mana artifacts that it works for, with Tarmogoyf to count towards uh, their ability. And you just get two fights out of one card. And you really just want that because most of your creatures are pretty big. And you're just getting such a tempo advantage from being able to constantly fight their creatures and pick them off. Um, so I definitely recommend a one of Gruel Club for sure. General, just a really efficient, it's a 4 mana 5 4, right? It's counting towards your um, Channeler of Mites. And when this thing gets to attack more than once, it's just allowing you to go, you know, way over the top. It's pumping the creatures in your hand. You're getting free, free 2 twos. If you can craft this card, in green, it's just it's just a really good card to have. Um, now, Daybreak Ranger, just the, it's crazy. The play patterns with this card are just so insane. Where you're you're usually because you're getting these fragile mana gems, you're going like one drop, two drop, three drop, and you're playing this on turn four, and having it flip into a five four reach that kills something, deals five damage to something, and it has ward. It's just such a good card in aggro and mid-range matchups it, it just does so so much work um so i definitely recommend this card if you if you don't have it ulrich if he's attacking more than once you're probably winning the game um you know at worst he's a five minute five five that trades with something and gets you a free creature um that that has moonlight so it already sort of very synergistic with your deck 
And, you know, I would say the best play pattern is you play this with two fragile mana, you attack for five, it lives through combat ideally, and then you flip it, give all your creatures an upgrade that following turn. And you get a six something trample out of it. So, um, yeah, playing with this, this with seven mana and allowing it to attack through is probably the most ideal play pattern. Centaur Sage, this thing saves you in any mid-range and even control matchup if you're able to stick it because you're just going to draw so many cards because you're getting the war boars which are drawing you into more creatures which allows you to play more creatures to then up your creature count to get more war boars so uh centaur sage really now that the format has slowed down a bit because jace is not you know terrorizing people on turn five and six or seven the card just does a tremendous amount of work so i feel like we sped through a lot of that um just excited to play i think these last four cards i think or you can work with the no you could tweak the numbers a bit i've been pretty happy with two lava wave um most of the time when you're just one-sided wiping the board i don't think most decks have a way to come back from that um and that's why i think having two of these is pretty important because also if you think about how the matchups are going you're putting a bunch of creatures on the board. They have to answer them or match them, right? So you're basically making them fight for board position up until, you know, turn five, six, or seven, and then you just slam them with a lava wave and they get completely punished for trying to match your board presence, right? It's just a really good card that synergizes with what you're kind of making your opponent do. Um, Overrun, though, I will say, like, I think you got to have at least one of these in the deck. It turns board states that, that are really sketchy, where you've got like a 5-1, you know, maybe a 4-2 who's, who's gotten chump block last turn, and like, you know, a 3-3. A three, three. It turns them into real threats, and often what will happen is you, if you have, I would say, three to four creatures on the board and you've got Overrun in your hand, you're probably just going to close the game out with Overrun. Um, and it, it just allows you to attack in for lethal when you likely could not have. And of course, we got to talk about Crater of Behemoth. I've been thinking about do I want a second one in my deck, and I've really landed on this configuration for a couple reasons. Crater Hoof is obviously very, very good in what allows this deck to have even more capability to go over the top, right? It's 5-5 five, five, five haste, pumps all the creatures on the board for you and in your hand. The thing is, Oftentimes, I would say, like, Overrun might be better, but for certain board states, Behemoth is better. So, it's just one of those trade-offs where, like, what do you think is going to have the most impact? And I would say Lava Wave has the most impact, from what I've seen, on board states. And then I would say, like, Crater Hoof and Overrun are just conditional, they're sort of contingent on what the board state is. Whereas Lava Wave, in general, is going to be what will help you. Um, but Crater Hoof, Behemoth... Is just incredibly powerful you can you know really set up your board states so that if you draw the behemoth it you know wins the game for you and often if you're landing this card it's probably going to win the game for you um because even if they answer some of you know are able to block some of what you're doing on the board it also pumps everything in your hand so you can also play around that and be like okay on turn six or seven i'm going to try and like make sure i have a war boar in my hand after playing a couple creatures so that when i do or if i have the behemoth in my hand already or i do draw it then i'm getting extra value on the free creatures that the deck is generating so that's that's domri in a nutshell and i'm just really excited to get into some gameplay because i think the deck just it just feels really powerful i just feel like at every step in the game if I'm curving out re reasonably, you're just applying a ton of pressure and you've got a lot of inevitability. Um, but I'll pause for a second here. Just kind of change the screen up for a second. The two worst matchups are Teferi and Liliana. Now, Teferi, I think I explained a little bit earlier, the traps can be very efficient. You have to, like, figure out how to bait them out. You have to, you know, hope that you get your treetop... Uh, you know, elf to, to sort of get things through. It's not unwinnable. It's definitely a matchup that requires a lot of skill to kind of maneuver, but it's definitely pretty winnable. Um, if you know what play patterns can kind of come up the most. The Liliana matchup, though, 
is just basically unwinnable. Um, I've beaten it maybe, you know, 20, maybe 30% of the time that I've faced it because you just don't have a way to interact with the big lich. Um, it's going to attack you, and if they have, if they just have the straight up uh, turn four win where they like, or, or turn, I guess it's turn five, where they like, they mill with the conveyor on turn three or two, they stick the lich with zombify, and then they give it the, the silent strike. You literally, you just can't beat that. Um, and there's no way for you to really remove the lich in the time that they're going to do that. I have won games where I'm pressuring a lot and they're missing and they're not hitting their lich and then they they land it on turn six or seven where they're really low in life total and then you slam something like Lava Wave or Crater Hoof Behemoth and you just overwhelm them or, or overrun. Um, but basically just know playing this deck and I, 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 I say this to be kind to everyone who's playing it you're going to lose the Liliata matchups. Still play them out. I still think it's, you know, there are ways to win. But just know that, like, that's the concession you're making when you play this deck. You're not going to beat Liliana. So if you're seeing a lot of Liliana in your bracket, probably don't play this deck. Just because it's going to be basically an auto loss for you. Teferi is beatable. Definitely not favored. Um, but here's the good part. Every other deck in the field... And I've been recording my results with Team MTGSS and looking at the win rates against every aggro deck, against every mid-range deck, and even against some of the other control decks, you are just favored. So, I, you know, I come from the place of a Magic player where I would rather have a deck that is just generally good against most of the field than, than play a deck that's like 100% in certain matchups, but is a 50-50 or less in most other ones. So when you're playing Domri, and hopefully what we can see today, is that it just has game against basically the entire field, aside from two decks, Teferi and Liliana. Um, and I think that's just really valuable information so that people don't get frustrated playing this deck. If they're like, oh, well, all I'm seeing is Liliana or Teferi, then you might want to change it up and maybe take a look at Rel, maybe take a look at Nyssa, you know, uh, maybe play Teferi yourself, maybe play Liliana yourself. Um, but I do think that Domri for climbing uh, has just felt incredibly strong. And as long as the meta is, is where it is, where we're not seeing as much Teferi or Liliana, I think that Domri is just probably the prime choice. So uh, I think with that, let's just get into some games. Um, just been really having pretty successful sessions climbing. And I would like to keep going up, you know, and see how far we can get. Ah, okay. This will be a good matchup. I think Domri's definitely favored into Ral. Ral can still win it, but uh, this is kind of why I like playing the deck, is because when you see a lot of Ral, I think Domri's got pretty good game into it. Oh, wow. Okay, this is pretty good. So we've got ways to generate mana pretty early. Agitators is usually going to die against them, but having Dancer into Paradise, Flip, and then Grudge Match... Definitely a, a good, cheap hand that can interact with what they're doing. And it's good we start with the Fragile Banner Gem. It means that they can't um, they can't start with a uh, thing in the ice. And I think we're not going to lead with Channeler of Might because I would rather, um, I'd rather see if I can get the proc next turn. But also, if I go double one drop here and then I go Paradise, that's not the worst either. So it kind of depends. But I think I think 9 times out of 10, you want to save your fragile mana gems with the deck because you just can do so much work with them. Like, by saving this, I can probably get Agitators to flip uh, when I play it on turn 3. So. We'll see what our, our friend Mr. Mon Man is doing over there. A very high-ranked uh, streamer. Um, and player in the game. Definitely a huge contributor in the uh, MTG Spell Slingers Discord, which is fun that we get to play against them. So I think next turn, what we're thinking about doing is maybe needing to grudge match something if it comes down, or just playing Channel of Might and Birds of Paradise, and then flipping our uh, Sundancer. 
I also love the art on this card, the, like, Red Riding Hood thing. And then when it turns into the wolf, it still has, like, the cape, which I think is really cool. So I wonder what they're thinking about here. Maybe they're wondering if they should play Thing in the Ice. And I think generally against green decks, you can't really do that. Oh. Okay, I wonder if they disconnected. Or maybe they don't. They don't want to play any spells this turn because they can't really combo off. That's definitely possible. I do know who you are. Great, so we do this. We flip into a 4-3. See, he still has the little little cape. Little red riding cape. Okay, here we go. Yeah, Surge Opus. Yep. And probably a shock. Or like burn through or something. Anticipate. Okay. Okay, it's really important that this did not get toughness. Oh, well, all right. Um, huh. Well, I think we're actually going to change up our plan here. I think the move is we go Agitator, and we actually have the Agitator fight this, because it's a less useful body. Um, and then we attack for four, because we definitely have to answer this. That's kind of priority number one. So... I'm just going to do this. Oh, don't need to attack with the bird. So great. So we, we dealt with their first Mizzy monstrosity. That's good. At the worst, next turn, we just prep a worm's wake. Okay, divination. That's fine. Great. Okay. Oh, actually, Hermit of the Flock's even better. So get in for four. Let's get this on the board. We get to flip it, gain some life, which is super relevant. So we're not going to play the Warbore here. Um, <laughs> not bad. Not going to play the Warbore because we want our guy to flip and to gain life. So we're going to do that. Turns into a 4-4. It's another threat that they have to deal with. Okay, thing in the ice. So it looks like they're going to flip it this turn. It's definitely annoying. Um, but, you know, we're working our way towards Lava Wave pretty well. So we're on turn four now. It's always good to check your turn count just in case. Okay, so that's one spell. Unsummon, and then got a free spell. Journey in sight. Okay. Okay, well, milling Chaos Lightning is good for us. <laughs> Definitely rather than have no Chaos Lightnings. And they get to flip. Um, okay, well, we've got our Protector of the Meek. So we've got five mana to work with. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just Protector of the Meek and uh, Tusker here. And then we just pass the turn. So if they attack, I think we probably are pretty interested in blocking with uh, birds. Just because we don't have a good block with our current setup. And we just hopefully can work our way towards Lava Wave and just answer what they have and close the game out. I mean, we could we could block with one of our four threes here um, and then be able to attack through, but then they get a two for one, which I don't love. So I don't think I will do that. Okay, Pyromancer is good. It's going to definitely make it a little tougher for us to just sit here. Yep, when someone's good. And division. Okay. Okay, glad that didn't hit the bird. It's annoying that I hit this, or maybe it would have been best for us for it to hit our face, but all right, so in this case, I think I am just going to block here. Because um, we don't really have a great block on any of these. So I think this is fine. I'll block one of these. I think I will choose to take the four here. And we'll just redeploy our creatures, and hopefully it's enough to live till the next turn. Okay, Tarmoglyph's a, a pretty solid draw. Um, I'll definitely attack here. I don't imagine they will block. But maybe they do want to block here. Okay. Yeah, that's 
not surprised about that. All right, so we've got six mana to work with. So I think it's just going to be Meek, Tarmogoyf, and then, sure, we'll play a boar. And then we'll just hopefully be able to survive whatever happens this turn, and then Lava Wave, and uh, see if we can close it out. I mean, them having to just bounce this 4-4 each turn and not really getting any value out of their unsummons is definitely a pretty tough spot. Okay, Spark of Genius, always good. Jarring Insight. Okay, Centaur Sage. Tusker. Okay, they've got a lot of mana to work with here, so... Let's see what they're working with. Warding Flame, yep. Makes sense. Breakthrough, yep. That's good. Okay. Well, these are pretty easy blocks. I probably will chomp with the bird this turn. Yeah, that makes sense. I would probably not attack with that. Uh, Alright, so in that case, let's just trade to this. Luck here. Question is, do I do I take four? Mm. I think it's probably worth saving two life here. So let's see what their follow up is. Okay. Yep. Opus is is pretty good. That's definitely good enough for us to lava wave. I think. Yep. Guys, great. Also, we're gonna have nine here. If we had had 10, would that have been better? Eh, potentially. Oh, interesting. So we've got Daybreak Ranger. Uh, I think it's probably greedy not to lob a wave here. They have two mana. I wonder if they run the gate. We're about to see. Okay, they did not. And I am going to spend my mana gem to uh, play a board here because we've got Guy's Cradle going off next turn anyway. Okay, well, their rooftop lab hitting was, is definitely what they need to find a way to stabilize here, so. Okay, not bad. Yeah. Very strong turn from our opponent. Um, if we take six here... I mean, I, I want to force the trade, so I'll take six. <laughs> Hemoth. A little, a little late, my friend. So they have to block. And we'll just play out most of our hand here. just in case they have some way of going off again after drawing. I think I should have, just have another blocker here. Then we get to play Boar. All right, see what you got. No rooftop lab is good, so it's probably enough to close it out. Yeah, I mean, okay. Scepter, all right. Hopefully nothing too crazy here. Okay. All right. GG. I, was, I mean, it's still really close, right? Like, we were at seven, you know? And they almost, like, completely stabilized off that rooftop hit. So, very nice. Glad we got to showcase that matchup a little bit because that's you're going to see Rel on the ladder. So you just kind of want to be really cognizant of how to play it. And, you know, when you're playing Domri, a lot of time you're trying to take advantage of those fragile mana gems and just being able to, you know, stock them, stockpile them for your big spells. But a lot of times you can, in more matchups where you need to control the board early, what they allow you to do is 
you know, turns where you're like, okay, great, I'll get a free mana gem, I'll play my 3-1, I'll, f I'll use my worst creature to kill your best creature, right? And just being able to have that modality between, okay, I have extra mana to use in the early turns, or, okay, I'm going to use this mana later to close out the game, is just what allows you to be really flexible in these matchups, which I really, really love. So we're on the play, We've got birds, that's not bad. I mean, it's a good curve. We're just going to go Birds, Tusker, into Agitator. They're playing Gideon, so we do want to be mindful of not getting beaten down early, but I still think this is a, just a pretty solid hand to start. I really have not seen any Gideon uh, in quite a while, so um, this will be kind of fun to play this matchup. <laughs> All right. Don't love drawing Crater Hoof <laughs> this early, but... That's the thing. When you play with this deck, you're sometimes going to hit your your four of your eight, you know, your eight drops. Okay, double rookie is a good start. Definitely a good start. Let's get Tusker down. Um, I think we do block next turn, because I think it's likely they just have armor, which will beef it up, but it'll still survive the combat. We'll see what they do. I mean... Okay, Steed. Yep. So let's be mindful of Divine Smite, right? We want to be mindful of how many creatures they have on the board, what their creature count can be. So yeah, I think this is just armor. So I guess I'd rather than pump this one that has lower toughness. Yeah. That's fine. We, we draw it out now. I'll take the two from the other one. Okay, Sage can be really good in this matchup. Got to play this. Get our free mana. So if they draw Divine Smite here, that's pretty rough. Because they just get to kill one of these and swing. So we'll see. We shall see. If they attack with both of these, we're going to block this first to get the... Uh, Oh, that's pretty good. That is pretty good. I think we're going to ignore this. So I think let's just... Well... I actually can't really ignore it that much, can we? So I guess... Yeah, I guess we'll go here. I often like to trade with the creatures that I can. Just so that they can't proc Gideon. But... Having a 4-4 four four just with armor on it is, is really tough to deal with. Okay. Well, Thalia doesn't really do anything. Oh, well, drawing actually another 2-drop here is pretty sweet. So I think... Although we don't have Greed Blocks for this. So if they have Divine Smite in their hand, pretty unlikely that they can smite this next turn. And if we go 2-2, two, two, we're going to get a boar, and we can play the boar. That's probably the play, even though Tarmogoyf is not huge here. And we're going to have 8 mana next turn with what we have. So maybe we take another hit and we trade or block. We take 7, go to 11, but then we play Greater Huff. Or we can chump with birds as well. Yeah, I think that's correct. I think we want to give ourselves the ability to play Crater Hoof next turn, or at the very least, Centaur Sage. So let's see what they draw. I mean, Divine Smiting something and attacking seems pretty good. Not a ton we can do about that. But they're going to have a hard time dealing with Behemoth, if that's the... Yeah, okay, that's fine. So if they attack with everything... Oh, they, oh I love this. I, I think there's no question you should be attacking with all of your creatures here, right? Because at worst, we're trading, and you're hitting me for 9, right? And I can chump block, but yeah, now I just, I'll just take 4. So I, I think that was a missed opportunity for our opponent. When you're playing Gideon, you have to be willing to trade creatures to get your passive procs. Um, yeah, I mean, also now, can draw something like that, and that changes the way the matchup's going to go, but I think we're just... This is just going to make it really hard for our opponent to stabilize. 
So just get to attack with everything. These creatures get pumped in her hand as well. Okay. So they can play Aura of Courage and force at least this trade. That's kind of it. I mean, unless they have Path to Exile, it's going to be pretty hard for them to get through at this point. Yeah, that's, that's not going to do it. All right, we've got six mana, so we've got a lot of options. Um, but I still think it's probably just better to slam the Sage. What would I want to fight? Basically nothing. I mean, I could just attack in here, right? Yeah. And they could, like, armor block here or here. I guess armor blocking here is probably the best. Okay, in that case now, I probably will play the War Boar and have something fight. So this is going to stop them from procking Gideon. So let's go Boar. Let's go Club. And let's have you fight you. And then I'm just going to... I'm actually just going to grudge match this and this. Yeah. So now they have no board. Uh, and we've got Guy's Cradle popping off next turn. We've got four creatures in play. We've got a way to fight. We've got Centaur Sage. So, oh, they're playing red. Okay, for Zozu. Interesting, interesting. But yeah, this is kind of how these matchups go into aggro. You just generate so much value and you get bigger so much quicker because of the ramp. Like, you know, we played played Behemoth on turn five, right? <laughs> it's just... It's going to be really hard for them to deal with a threat like that. And that's how I felt when I was playing against Domri, playing aggro. It's just like, their creatures are efficient, and then they just get to play these huge spells ahead of curve, and it's just like, okay, well... They can't win through a Lava Wave, they can't win through an Overrun. Or a Greater Hoof, so... It does feel like it makes your opponent have to race against the clock, and you never want to feel like you have to do that. Yeah, I don't really... I mean, you have to attack with Zozu, right? Like, it's, a, it's an 0-4. Yeah, okay. I think you have to trade for a creature there, but... To each their own. And now we just get to play Sage and fight the Zozu. Attack. It's fine. They can trade here. I'm just going to push 12 damage. I love club just like being on the board so that your next creature you cast can be the fight target and then you can just keep attacking through. All right, well, GG, GG, Cloud. I mean, I think the matchup's just really not favored towards them. Like, they, I think they missed out on one good attack, but it's just you really have to curve out to be uh, faster than what we're doing. Also, we had a pretty ideal curve with birds into blocker into ramp you know i it's i think we had a really really good draw so that kind of made the difference oops i don't know why i'm hitting my challenges let's just get into another game <laughs> okay the rematch against mon man sure sure let's do it and they're running kind of my favorite build of the deck too um so this will be fun We'll see, maybe they'll get their revenge this game. Alright, Flock is totally fine, Birds is great. We're we're on the draw here again, which is definitely good. Um, channeler, channeler. Okay, not the best. If we draw a five power creature, that would be really nice. But if we draw even like, you know, grudge match, that would be good. Hello. 
Domri's hello is the most, like, BM thing. I'm your personal apocalypse. <laughs> I do know who you are. Um, I could run out of one one, but again, I just... We should just be banking our mana. Okay, glad that hit me. But it's good to note that they have that in their hand. So they can use Warden Flame to remove Birds of Paradise at some point. Um, God, it's kind of a tempo play to run out the flock now with our extra mana gem that we have. I think that's the play. Because then next turn... Well, but next turn... Oh, yeah. Next turn we can go Mystic, or Channel of Might, rather, and then Worm's Wake. Yeah, I feel like that's that's correct. We don't get to flip it, but next turn we'll be able to flip it, and then the following turn we can play another Hermit, and that will um, that will flip as well. And the life gain against Ral is, like, really relevant, so... All right, so they just went double Isochron, so they're, they're going to have a bunch of different spells to select from to interact with us but they don't have anything on the board yet so that's good for us Let's see what they do here okay lava wave all right <clears throat> okay I'm just gonna get in and I think question is do I use my fragile mana gem and I think I don't need to I mean, these channel of mites have much more value when they are uh, not two twos. <laughs> when they're three threes, they're definitely more relevant body. So, all right. So this turn, I suspect we'll see a, a magnum opus or a thing in the ice. And we don't have any removal, so it's gonna be scary. <clears throat> But having the Worm's Wake is good because it'll likely allow us to attack through next turn. Like, even if they play Thing, it's going to stun an irrelevant creature. Okay, here's the Magnum Opus. I know they have at least Warding Flame, so I'm sure they have two cheap spells to go off here. Yep. Making a 3-5 is good. That's unfortunate. Retaliate. Also really good. And we actually can't attack through. That is very unfortunate. All right. Oh, man. I mean, I could attack here, but it's just... It's likely that this will just get more toughness later on. It's kind of a gamble to do that, because then also they can shock this. So I, I don't think we can afford to do that. Um, I think we're just going to play another flock. And flip and it's not a good position to be in when they've got a museum monstrosity on the board and you're not doing anything about it but I don't really think we have a better play here we just hope that we can draw a grudge match that's relevant or get to turn seven for the lava wave I hope it's enough yep thing in the ice that is good Yeah, they're definitely in a better position this match. Okay. Well, we're never <laughs> killing this monstrosity now, which is pretty unfortunate. Oh, and they've got the grudge match. That's really nice for them. Yeah. And they keep getting toughness too. Jeez, this is this is rough. Path to Exile? Oh, boy. Yeah, that's that's a bad time. Um, this can get bigger. And I think I need to try and keep it for Guy's Cradle, so I'll take four here. Generally, you don't want to take any damage against Ral that you can prevent, but I don't think we have a real choice. We're just going to deploy as many creatures as we can here. Try and slow things down. We get to flip this. And now if we start trading off like little chump blockers, that's fine, because we have ways to refill the board. Another thing in the ice, oh boy. Well, here's the thing, though. 
if we can somehow deal enough damage to this museum monstrosity to lava wave it, then maybe we've got a shot, but we have to get a pretty lucky for that to happen. Oh, well, yeah, that's, that's not good. Oh boy, yeah, this is, this is tough. Okay, well, I think we have to Lava Wave next turn to kill these anyway, so um, I guess let's block here. I think we just chump block. Interesting, Daybreak Ranger. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I think we just have to lava wave here, right? Yeah. Something. Buys us a little bit of time. Hopefully we can play Daybreak Ranger to kill this, but if this gets more than five toughness, it's going to be really hard for us to deal with it. They've got seven mana and five cards, so... Pretty unlikely that we uh, win this game at this point, but... We will try. Okay, five toughness. Please just go to power. Please just go to power. No. <laughs> Ugh. And they had the unsummon. Yeah. Yep, this is pretty much lethal. Oh, we just didn't... Yeah, now we get screwed by Guy's Cradle. So, that's pretty bad. Oh, what is... So, we just need to play as many blockers as possible. So, I guess... I'm pretty sure we lose anyway, but... I think this is kind of the only way for us to not die. Oh, and they get Rooftop Lab? Yeah, it's probably a GG. But yeah, that's how these matchups can go. You know, if they stick their threats and get to, you know, put you off yours, that's, that's how they win. Yeah, and they have Spark of Genius to get, like, a really relevant spell. Yeah. You got it. You got it, friend. Oh, they had Helion. Jeez, that's sweet. Oh. Good old Ral. All right, we'll see if we can get one more matchup here before we close out the video. But, um, yeah. So you're going to lose some games to Ral. But I think overall you're, you're pretty advantaged with the amount of fight spells and early interaction that you have. So, um, yeah. Let's see who else we can play against. And then we'll wrap up for today. Hmm. Okay, Drist. I feel like this is a pretty good matchup for Domri. Uh, but I do think Drist is probably the best aggro deck in the sense that it's it can scale up to be more of a mid-range deck. So, this is cool. Glad we can get this matchup here. Okay, uh, we can keep the Worm's Wake. We really can't afford to keep anything else here. Okay, but, oh boy. Well, I had to have one of these sorts of games. Um, we've been curving out pretty well up until now, so <laughs> starting with two 8-drops is how you can get punished playing this kind of deck. It, does, it really doesn't happen that often, I would say, because you only have four 8-drops in the deck, but what are you going to do? At least we're on the draw, so we can maybe deploy a Worm's Wake. Okay, that was, that was a sweet draw. Birds was good. It's a good chump blocker ramping us so we really need to make sure we are seeing these mana gems because we have to hit either of these two spells uh, ahead of curve to be able to uh, probably stabilize in this game so they could go like you know goo here that would be pretty good um, if they just go bard that's whatever uh, 
I'd be surprised if they don't have some sort of two drop. Okay, Elvish Archer, that's, that's fine. Interesting, so I could play Lookout, which is sort of the most man efficient thing, but this deck actually does run traps, so I'm wondering if I just run out Dancer, which is gonna flip into a relevant attacker anyway. I feel like that's better. And we're not under pressure, so I don't think I need to Worm's Wake this turn. So next turn we'll run at the Worm's Wake, and then maybe Treetop Lookout at some point. If they attack here, I'll just take it. Not, not going to play into their uh, Giant Growth. But I'm glad they have more of a defensive build with Elvish Archer, because I just want to go towards the late game anyway. Yeah, that's a good draw. They can attack through here. Not much I can do about that. So I'll just take the three. Don't really want to give up my birds yet. And it's good that they don't have their legendary stuff rolling. Oh, so this these are the kind of draws I'm talking about. I mean, luckily, we kind of lucked out because our opening hand was bad. We're going to get to go Worm's Wake this turn, and then next turn we get to play Daybreak Ranger, not lose our mana gems, and fight something. And it's just such a good play pattern when you have double mana gem. Yep, so we don't have any valid attacks. Um, we're probably going to take another three here. But uh, then we're going to really start accelerating after next turn. And we're just getting closer and closer to our eight drops. Which, if you're playing against Domri, you should just be keeping track of that at all times. Like, try and get their creatures off the board. Try and make sure that their guy's cradle is losing value. And just be mindful of when they can play an eight drop. Um because that's what you have to kind of contend with. Okay, so they attack for three. So we've taken six. Not ideal, but it's also not the worst thing in the world. Okay, Hero's Call. Okay. Get our Worm's Wake down, which is great. Um, yeah, just send. See if they do anything. My guess is they either chump or take five. Oh, okay. Get the armors up out of their hand. That's defensively. That's not bad. And now we just get to play Daybreak Ranger, target the elf, and take it down. I love this card so much, Nightfall Predator. And it turns into a 5-4 reach, which is just, like, so relevant in the meta right now. Like, being able to deal with flying threats. Um, I think is kind of important. Just such a huge body. Hero bot. Okay. That's interesting. I have not seen this card played in a, quite quite a while. Okay, so they've got no open mana. Um, so I could choose to trade my 4-3 for the 3-2. But I kind of don't want to do that because I'm probably going to play Crater Hoof next turn. So I think... We just can attack with our 5-4. Cool. And the birds actually has pretty good value with Behemoth. Um, so I think I'll just do the more mana efficient play. Well, although Channeler... That's fine. We, we can run out Channeler here and just get the, uh, the bonus... So they're more than haunted. Not bad for them. They have some mystery legendary card in their hand that we have not seen yet. So, I mean, their best play here, right, is just to play as many creatures as possible, and then we can just lob a wave. You know, it's just, like, so... So brutal. Because we'll go lava wave, and then next turn we can go Crater Hoof. Or if they don't have any valid blocks, we just go Crater Hoof. Oh, that's pretty good. Not a bad grudge match, which is definitely good with Elvish Archer because of the high toughness. Okay, well in this case I'm just going to run out the Crater Hoof because we can attack through all their creatures. So yeah, and it pumps our entire hand. They can trade here. That's reasonable. But they're taking minimum 10 here. <laughs> so brutal.
I mean, they've got a lot of cards in hand. I mean, maybe there's a way for them to uh, to just um, put out as many bodies. But again, it's just like on on turn seven or turn six rather, you get to play an eight drop, and then because of Gaia's Cradle, you're going to play another eight drop on turn seven. So six and seven; those are the pivotal turns for this deck, which is why on turn five you want to be thinking about your fragile mana gems and how you're going to enable your guy's cradle. And I honestly, like, even though I should probably know, I always just go look and it's like, okay, turn down six, right? You know, because sometimes when you have multiple fragile gems, it kind of, like, messes with your, your internal clock of, like, what turn is it? Um, so, you know, no shame. Just go check the turn count. And, uh, okay. Well, I definitely got a lot of blockers, but... It's not really going to do it, friend. I'm sorry. Yep. I mean, this is usually how these matchups go with Drist. You just go over the top. But also, they were running an interesting build. I, I don't know. I, I played Drist quite a lot, so I'm sure there are other ways you could build it. But, uh, yeah, not, not bad for... A couple of games played and um yeah i just appreciate everybody stopping by drop a like drop a comment drop a subscribe um really just trying to put out a bunch of content now that i'm back from kind of like the holiday break um so let me know if there's stuff you want to see i probably will get liliana up on the channel uh into fairy as well just because i think those are viable decks um i think sarah also i'm working on a little spicy sarah build and I'm hoping to bring that out at some point. Um, but, like I said, I really just uh, encourage everyone, if you're really having a tough time climbing, and you've got most of these cards, I just can't recommend this deck enough. I just think that it's proactive, you can be flexible, it's modal, you're, not, you're often having really good draws, like no creature is really ever bad at any point, necessarily. Um... You know, there's just, and, and you can customize it, you know, like you can even look at, oh, are there any red traps or green traps that I can combo with my moonlight creatures? Um, there's just a, lo a lot of flexibility to the deck, and uh, I hope it was helpful to kind of see some of it in action in the upper mythic tier, um, and just appreciate your support. We'll catch you next time. Thanks.